So what exactly is dating? Now, the definition is pretty simple. It's a stage in the romantic relationship in which two individuals engage in an activity together, most often with the intention of evaluating each other's suitability. It falls into the category of courtship, consisting of social events carried out by the couple. Now, how does that translate into real world application? Well, over in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, as many of you guys know, arranged marriages are pretty common. That being said, love marriages or the idea that people should actually meet up and see if there's any compatibility is becoming more common. Over in Japan, there's a service called Omiya in which the parents hire a matchmaker. The matchmaker takes resumes, pictures, then finds what they believe to be a suitable person, and then the parents meet and they all agree, and then they pressure the couples to actually get married. Now, Singapore took it to a whole other level. We're talking the Social Development Network, the SDN, whose sole purpose is to promote marriage. In fact, the state-funded SDN touts marriage as what should be a person's number one life goal. My favorite, though, is how the Naigatan people of Ethiopia do it. According to their traditions, there are only four paths to marriage. There's arranged marriage, supervised courtship, there is inheritance, and abduction. I mean, imagine that. You just went out for a beer and all of a sudden you got a hood over your head and next thing you know, you are at the altar marrying this woman you've never seen before. But seriously, gents, when it comes to dating, most people will tell you it sucks. And the research backs this up. 10 years ago, it was bad. Now, 47% of Americans say that it is even worse than it was a decade ago. In fact, since the Me Too movement, 65% of men say dating is harder. And the women weren't far behind. 43% of those polled said that it had become more difficult. So why is dating dying? Specifically, what's making it disappear? Now, the idea of dating is a fairly new construct, even in the Western world. In fact, the word goes back to an 1896 column in the Chicago Record. A columnist named George Ada was writing about the working class and their lives. And he was talking about a guy named Artie and what was going on with his relationships. Apparently, his girlfriend was losing interest in him. And whenever he confronted her about this, he simply said, I suppose the other boys are filling in all my dates. Now, it took a few decades for the word to stick, but women were out on their own engaging with men and these men would buy them food and drinks or gifts. And in the eyes of the authorities, this made them whores. Basically, they view this as the same as turning a trick. Now, by 1910, girls going out on dates like this were known as charity girls because they didn't take any money for their favors. They were just simply out to have a good time. In fact, there were reports of prostitutes in the 1920s complaining about these charity girls because they were putting them out of business. In the 1920s and 30s, we saw the rise of the shop girl, a single woman working in a department store, living in a city, a larger place where, you know, she lived on her own and she was free to make up her mind who she was going to engage with. All the men that were coming up, buying things in her store, courting her, maybe asking her out. Yeah, she was kind of setting her own agenda. Now, the 1940s, as you know, marked by World War II. And guess what? Women are now in the workplace. They've got a taste of what it's like to actually make pretty good money and things never went back. The 1950s, yeah, we still stuck to a lot of traditions. Dating and courtship was still around, but we saw it really relax in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Now, taking a step back, let's talk about marriage. Throughout history, marriage has been an alliance between families, different levels, but in general, you stood within your class. If you were high class, you married other high class people. If you were lower class, yeah, you didn't really have much chance to get out of there. You were stuck with people in your class because everyone knew where people People stood. As such, arranged marriages for most of human history were pretty much the norm. In fact, the idea of a romantic relationship didn't even exist in marriage. I mean, in the 12th century book, The Art of Courtly Love, it stated, true love can have no place between husband and wife. That being said, love, of course, did exist in some arranged marriages. And if you look at arranged marriages as a whole, happiness levels do go up over time because people approach this as, hey, we've got to make this work. We're stuck together versus a lot of love marriages start off really happy, but then yeah, it wears off after a couple years and uh, happiness levels go down and they are more likely to lead to divorce. That being said, throughout recorded history, there has been the existence of matchmakers. Nowadays, a lot of us think, oh, I would never use a service like that. Here's the thing, is that this used to be the norm. And those matchmakers, they weren't always like a professional matchmaker. Oftentimes, it was your mother, it was 
the family unit. It was perhaps a friend or an advisor, somebody that was looking out for the family, somebody that was looking out for the group and said, hey, you know, I know of this boy over here. I know of this girl over here. This would make a perfect alliance. Let's get them together. Now, in 1959, there was a single event with about 100 people involved that would go on to change dating forever. And before I reveal what happened, I want to reveal the sponsor of today's video, Vitaman. And seriously, gents, these are our starter kits. If you're 45 and single wanting to take better care of your skin because, hey, you want to look good for the ladies, we've got you covered. If you're 25 and taken, but you just want to have thicker, fuller hair because it's thinning a bit prematurely and you don't want to put drugs in your body, we've got you covered with our thinning hair kit. If you're in your 30s dealing with dry hair, if you're in your 50s dealing with oily hair, guys, I've got the perfect kits for you. I back everything up with a money back guarantee. You've got issues, you come to me. I stand behind every product we sell, leveraging our natural and organic ingredients from the Australian Outback. Now, this deal, gents, is not going to be around forever. Make sure to use that link. Go over to Vitamin. Again, this is my company, so I make sure you guys get the best deal on the web. Use this link. Go check them out. Awesome company. Hey, it's mine, so of course, I'm proud to support them. So, what happened in 1959? So, over at Stanford University, they took 49 men and 49 women, and they started this project called the Happy Families Planning Services. They used a simple questionnaire and an IBM 650 to match those 49 men with those 49 women based on what they perceived to be good compatibility. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the first computer dating service. Six years later, over at Harvard, they took this to a whole other level. They called it Operation Match. They did about the same thing using a questionnaire and an IBM 1401, but one small difference. They charged for the service, $3, and within six months, they had made $270,000. That's about almost $2 million in today's dollars. Over in France in the 1980s, using the Minitel network, they started their first pink chat rooms. Basically, you had people talking, not even seeing each other. Again, the idea here was for people that wanted to meet and date. Now, the first dating site, kiss.com, wouldn't launch till 1994, but it was match.com in 1995 that really took online dating to a whole other level. And let's talk about specialty sites. So, if you were Jewish, yid.com, founded in 1995. Shadi.com, an online wedding service founded over in India. Gaydar, launched in 1999. The name says it all. Christian Mingle, 2001. If you want to break up your marriage, Ashley Madison. Soon we saw the rise of the apps, Grindr, Tinder, Bumble. And that takes us to today. So, with all of these options, why are so many people giving up and walking away and saying, you know what? This just isn't worth it. Reason number one, there is no return on investment. So, this quote from Noah right here, honestly, because it's way too much work and too little gain. We're expecting to initiate, start contact, ask them out, and sometimes pay for them. Women are expected to just show up. Your right hand is easier to get enjoyment out of than fighting a losing cause. There you have it. Straight up, a lot of guys don't feel it is worth the work. They would just rather have a relationship with Pamela Henderson. Next up, let's talk about how expensive it can be, especially if you're going out for dinner, maybe you're going to a movie, whatever it is you're setting up, you are most likely paying. I know a lot of guys go Dutch, but for a lot of guys that are paying, they're like, hey, it's just not worth it. It can easily go past $100, maybe even $200. If you're in New York City, you're out in Los Angeles, all of a sudden you find you're with somebody and they don't want to meet up again. They ditch you and you are stuck with the check. Reason number three, she lies about her appearance. Okay, maybe she's just putting her best foot forward, but you could have sworn in the profile that she put 130 pounds and five foot five, not five foot three, 230 pounds. And there's a big difference there. I mean, it's usually not that extreme, but a lot of you guys have had that. In fact, I've had men tell me, a lot of my friends that are out dating, they're like, hey, I'll look at five to six photos. Hopefully, she's got something up where somebody else took it. And then I can see her from an angle that, uh, yeah, isn't maybe so flattering. And I can see if I'm actually attracted to her. Next up, let's talk about the overinflated ego. So many guys listed this as, hey, this woman is used to being able to put up a profile and having a hundred guys within a day basically try to grab her attention. And uh, this isn't reality because on the list, she's actually a four out of 10. And there's no way that she should have this much attention. And it builds up, her, it over, overblows her expectations and what she thinks she deserves. Now, personally, I've been out of the dating scene for a long time. But all the research, everyone I've spoken to that's out there, they talk about this, how as a guy, it's crickets. You're not getting anyone to respond, especially if you're under, you know what, six foot, if you don't have, you know, 
a lot of money, if you're not flashing, if you are not in that top 1%, you're not getting anything, it seems like, online versus women. And you can put up an average profile and it seems like she's just getting slammed with, you know, guys that are just thirsty and hungry trying to get her attention. Throw on top of this a culture that says you deserve everything. You deserve the best. Go get it, queen. A lot of guys just feel that, hey, this has created a lot of women that have this mindset that, yeah, they're, oh, they expect way too much. The next reason why guys are giving up on dating, I am going to blame Chad. Yes, that top 1% of guys that seems to get all of the women online. It seems like that, yeah, that 1% is getting 99% of women online fawning after. Why is this happening? It didn't seem to happen in the past. And that is true to an extent. Let's talk about what the internet brought. It reduced friction to almost zero. So literally, you know, instead of having to go to a place and meet up when you have a limited group there and you've got to kind of make do with what is present, most of us simply go online and there is unlimited choice. And to be able to go through that unlimited choice, you just need to flick your finger. So literally, uh, the friction is almost zero. Next up, out of economics, we get the winner takes all. And this is where someone that is just slightly better than others is going to draw in the vast majority. Think about it. If you walk into a store and you got 500 bucks, do you want the second best, the third best, or the best product that you can get for your money? Maybe it's a phone, maybe it's a camera, whatever it may be. You want the best for your money. And that's the same with people online. Everyone wants to go for the best that they can get. But in a friction high situation, let's say you walk into a room and there are 20 people and there are 10 men, 10 women, and each of them have numbers on their head. There was a great experiment that did this. What's going to happen if you tell everyone, hey, match up with the highest number quickly? So, the 10 is going to find either a 9 or a 10. Everyone's going to gravitate towards those 10s. They will be taken quickly. And then the 8s, then the 9s, then or 7s. You, you get the point. It's just going to go down. If you are a 1, if you are a 2, if you are a 3, you're going to find that everyone is turning away from you. And you are going to learn that, hey, I'm not bringing or I'm not as attractive or I'm, there's just something about me that is turning off other people. And eventually, you're going to look around. There's only going to be a set number of people left and you're going to want to pair up quickly so that you at least have someone to go with. I know it is cruel, but it's the way things are. But online, this has disappeared. So, what you get is this top percentage has their pick. And the reality is a lot of these top guys, they still want to eventually pair up, perhaps, if they do want to pair up with someone that is at the same level and caliber. Now, being men, one of the things with guys is that they don't mind just a hookup for the night or for a couple nights, whatever it may be. And they'll, st if no one's going to find out about it, yeah, she's a four, but no one's going to know, you know, I got nothing going on. Let's make it happen. But what this does to uh, the other side is it sometimes gives them a false sense of, hey, I hooked up with a nine. I hooked up with a 10. This is what I deserve or I should end up with. And the reality is that was just a hookup for that other person. And it maybe inflated their ego to a level and makes it much more harder. Again, because there were just other nines that will continue to hook up with them and they find five years down the road that, yeah, this is just taking, taking me down a path that now I can't even hook up with people that are at my same level. And to throw on top of that, let's talk about the paradox of choice and why that's making dating even worse. Because if you only had 10 people that you could potentially date, okay, you know, you it's almost like an arranged marriage. You would say, you know, she's attractive enough or you know, it's good enough. We're going to make this work. Let's build a life together. And this is what happened for the majority of, I mean, the majority of people would marry somebody that was just within a couple of miles of them. And this is most recorded history. Now we've got, I mean, I met my wife and she's on the other side of the world. And I'll talk a little bit about that story at the end of this video. But, uh, you know, most times that paradox of choice though comes with consequences because you are always wondering if you, you know you're in a decent relationship and it's good everything seems hunky dory but you hear these stories about oh this other couple they're traveling the world they're infatuated with each other it, the grass is greener on the other side so because you have so many choices nowadays with online options people oftentimes give up a good for the chance at what they perceive to be amazing and this can lead to, I think, a lot of regret because they pass up or they give up on a relationship that was actually great, but they didn't see it because they were chasing something else. And let's talk about those filter factors. 
you have to go into this actually knowing what you like. And one of the reasons that a lot of guys are giving up on dating and, you know, they don't even know what they want. They, you know, I, a lot of guys say that women don't know what they want, but a lot of guys don't know either. And that's one of the more interesting things about talking and meeting with people in person is you engage with them, you spend more time with them, you start to discover the things that you want and what you don't want. One of the advantages, I think, of being a little bit older, especially if you pay attention, is you start to identify, hey, this is important to me and I'm not going to compromise here. But initially, you know, you got people that are going out there and saying, oh, I want someone to be this height or I want them to be, have this build. I want them to have these hobbies. I want them to live within this amount of distance from me versus, I mean, there's no filters. If you think about it for what type of relationship does this person have with their family and friends? But that's actually, I know for me, one of the biggest determinants when I met my wife, I was just really impressed with the way that she treated her family, the relationship we have with all of her friends. Uh, I didn't have the best relationship with my family and I knew I wanted to create a family. Like looking back, I, I can see that I saw that, but that's something that when you're going in and creating these filters, you initially don't know. So we're being drawn into identifying, you know, certain characteristics, which at the end of the day, do they matter that much? Now, this next reason why guys are giving up on dating, I don't think is necessarily bad. And that is there's less societal pressure from families, from friends, from, you know, just simply, you know, governments in general, they're not pressing this down except over in Singapore, but no, seriously, uh, you know, you don't have society as a whole frowning down upon the fact that people can be dating. They can actually be in a long-term relationship. They can have kids in those relationships without getting married. Um, you know, people having sex before marriage is not nearly, you know, as frowned upon as it used to be. And for a lot of people, this is a great thing. Tons of guys love the hookup culture. Personally, I do think that it would be great to be in a long-term relationship and I'll talk about my stance on all this at the end of this video, but um, you know, tons of guys out there say, hey, you know, this is even better for us because we don't have to, you know, commit to marriage and we get all the fruits. And of course, let's address the elephant in the room. Half of marriages end in divorce. So a lot of guys are like, you know, if the end goal is to get married only to have a 50-50 shot of it failing, why in the world am I even going down this path? Seriously, I read this comment by this guy named Dan Cody and he said, how does being in a romantic relationship make my life better? I used to think of long-term committed relationships as the pinnacle of human experience, but in recent years, I've wondered. Now, my parents enjoyed a loving 55-year marriage and that was my example. But when I compare long-term couples today to my dating experiences, were on different planets. It used to be people grew up together. There's deep communication, trust, and affection. By comparison, people on dating sites are justifiably wary. It's a very long road to what exactly? Companionship? I've got that with good friends. Love? I've also got that with good friends. Sex? Okay, that may be an addiction, but loveless sex is somewhere between opportunistic at best and misleading at worst. It's hardly fulfilling, yet many women are looking for just that. I'm better off, at least for now, going to dinners, on bike rides, kayak trips, skiing, and to musical performances with my friends. And I have to admit, gents, as a married guy, I completely see Dan's point here. So all that being said, what if you want a long-term relationship? What if you want to get married? What if you want to date? how to make it better. Well, gents, my answer is if I know, but seriously, I don't have the solution, but I do have five kids and I want them to have loving, meaningful relationships. So this in general is going to be the advice I give them. First up, have your standards, know what's important to you. And on those areas, don't bend. That being said, when you find someone that you can build a life with, it's okay to compromise in certain areas. I know I used to be a very organized and I thought like incredibly, you know, a little bit OCD kind of person. My wife, not so much. And I've learned that I can live with, yes, a little bit of a messy house because there's so much other joy that is brought to us, just the messiness that is life. Next up, be the person that you would want to to date. I'm not saying have a sex change here. What I'm saying though is be your best self. If you want to date someone that's in shape, then get yourself into shape. If you want to date someone that doesn't get drunk and crazy, well, don't be going out there getting drunk and crazy. The next tip, stay in touch with traditional matchmakers. No, I'm not talking professionals. I'm talking your parents. I'm talking your siblings, your friends, people you know at work. Those people right there have historically and for a long time been great sources of finding. Yes, I know a lot of people are online dating. You're meeting people through all these apps, but that is still not even 30% of relationships. The other 70% 
are still met in these other ways, through church, through volunteer organizations. And it may not seem like it at times, but these matchmakers, these friends, your family, they are actually looking out for you. And they are kind of vetting these people. So all of a sudden they're saying, hey, there's this great girl, uh, you know her sister, but you know that she's back home from college or she's back from graduate school. You got to meet her. This is all of a sudden they're trying to make things happen. And the idea here is that, uh, yeah, she's not crazy. Uh, or at least, you know, no one has been able to detect this so far. She's actually going to a decent school. She's got a good head on her shoulders. She's cute. At least that's what your mom says. So why not take them up on it? Guys, this is a great way to meet people. Pick up a hobby, start swing dancing, join a Dungeons and Dragons club. Yes, I've got a friend. He met a beautiful girl at a Dungeons and Dragons group that uh, he just happened to be at. He's in the cosplay. She's into it too. And all of a sudden, you know, he's looking to propose to her here soon. And he wouldn't have expected this. She's a lawyer. She's amazing. She's beautiful. What in the world was she doing there? Well, guys, you're never going to find these type of people unless you put yourself out there. And yes, you are going to fail. You are going to ask somebody out and they're going to turn you down because they got a boyfriend. But here's the deal, gents. You at least swung. You took a chance. And lastly, gents, don't give up on love. Now, I'm paraphrasing Jeff Bezos here, but he said that failure and success are inseparable twins. To succeed, you have to risk. And if you already know what the outcome is going to be, there's no risk involved. Now, most people are not willing to go through the failures to be able to win with an outsized return. And by an outsized return, imagine if there was a one in 10 chance that you could get a 100 payoff. Guys, you would want to take that bet every day. Now, when you take that bet, nine out of 10 times, you're going to fail. But whenever you connect, whenever you hit, all of a sudden you are getting a 100 times return. So let's equate this with marriage. Now, you know, 50% of marriages are going to fail. So you have a 50% chance of the marriage lasting. Of that, let's say that half are happy marriages. So you got 25% left. And of that, let's just say that 10% of marriages are really happy or ones that you would want to be in. So one in 10 chance to having a great marriage, yet a great marriage, if that's going to improve your life by a hundred times, possibly, I think it's like by a thousand times, if it's like winning the lottery, and I think it is when you have a great life partner, then you want to go for that. You want to take that bet every time. Now for me, I've been with my wife 20 years. In fact, I told her I was going to marry her after meeting her just for, you know, I, maybe it was a trick to try to get into her pants. Point being is I wrote her a letter and I told her I'm going to marry her. And I had to fly to the other side of the world twice. I was interrupted by deployment, then interrupted by a war, but I got my way over there and I showed her that I was serious. And I have to say that the romanticism, maybe the separation apart, us writing letters, then emails and living over there. Yeah, we've had our ups and downs, but overall for me, a long-term relationship with someone I've been able to build a life with has been something that is incalculable in how much I value this. And it's really, it's, it's my life. And it's something that I wouldn't trade for the world. Now, gents, if you enjoyed this video, you are going to love this one. Why did men stop wearing capes? Seriously, I mean, capes look amazing. Why did men stop wearing them? And I'll tell you that over in the United States Marine Corps, we did not stop wearing them. We still rock the boat cloak. And I get into that in this video. So yeah, find out how you can bring back the cape in this video right here.